Well, let's go. I decided to go back with the ponies and uh, rip some shares out. I had to put his jacket on. I found this old jacket's not that thick. And I put on my thin hunting pants to try to thwart the onslaught of these blood sucking little bastards. It's funny, you know, the mare, I uh, put a halter on her, I walked her down the road from the barn about 15 yards. And there must have been about a hundred mosquitoes clouded all around her, just like that, just rising up from the ground. It's amazing. It's just amazing. And uh, But I lathered them both up with bug dope here, uh, kind of an hour and a bit ago, so they're pretty relaxed. You can tell by their tails. They're hanging pretty straight. So I lathered myself up to see if I could manage to hammer out some shares out here. And uh, it's been pretty action packed days, right? It's never a shortage of things to do, especially when you're about to move. Sequence of events is tomorrow, 2 o'clock, we meet the lawyer down in the city, paying for the house. And then on the 5th, we arrive, and the morning of the 6th, we get the keys, and it's off to the races. Uh, I don't think there's any need to say where online. Let's just say it is definitely a piece of paradise. And as far as these, these hairy bastards go, these wild people, there's probably more action around the place I'm moving to than there is here, which is hard to believe, but and I'm no stranger to it. It is what it is. But anyway, I always write down a bunch of things I want to talk about, and eventually soon I will, once I can just relax. It's way better when I can jump in the quad or jump, go hike, and get up into my mountains, get into my zone, and then my mind's clear, i got no distractions, I know exactly what I want to deliver to you guys, and give you a heads up about, and uh, make some real good quality messages and shares from all the people, right? And as well, show you some of these epic scenes from the real world. So you guys all see the real world, right? It's funny, um, I was gonna make that video for the Rubble channel, I haven't had a chance to yet, but what it basically is, comes down to is words straight from the RCMP and straight from the doctor about um, the stats on suicides and as well the facts about getting the needle for the COVID. And it's very, very alarming. So when you have the doctor tell you, as opposed to hearing it on social media, what are you going to do with that information? Are you going to keep a bottle up inside you, or are you going to share with the people what the doctor said? And the doctor's too scared to say it publicly because they'll get their license revoked. <laughs> and that's fact straight to me. All right, this isn't third hand. It's not hearsay. I didn't read it on the internet. So you're going to take from what you will or leave it. But all I can say is this for a quick heads up is the doctor said if there's no way you can get out of getting that needle as he advised you take the COVID, uh, the, the Pfizer one. But other than that, um, there's some very alarming facts that I've learned on my own looking into it that I am going to share with you. Am I getting the needle? You probably already know the answer to that. Teach your own. It's just a topic for the Rumble Channel, unfortunately. And Snar thing is very unfortunate and very frustrating is here we are, the year 2021, we're so advanced. Human, human beings are so advanced that we have to struggle to find a place to get honest information and to share honest information. We have to struggle. Isn't that amazing? The year is 2021 and we have to struggle to find a safe place to speak openly about various topics. If that isn't enough for you to to throw up at least a dozen red flags in this lifetime? I don't know what is. It doesn't get more obvious, more simple than that, right? Oh, boy, I got a whole list in my phone here on my list of things I wanted to drop and talk about, but I'm just gonna have to wait because I don't want to babble up too much time. I don't want to take up the time that can be used to share numerous people's experiences because that's where the knowledge is, that's where the honest truth is, and that's the only place you are going to get honest knowledge today this point of the game. It's the only place. It's from the people. Okay? Uh, it's funny. Somebody said, you know, the word bio biologist, the title biologist keeps coming up, or anthropologist or scientist keeps coming up when these beings, this reality is being discussed. And I find that comical. Do you want to know why I find that comical? It's because not one of these people who have that man-made label went through their schooling in university learning about the Sabe, the Sasquatch, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so when I read somebody or see somebody online who has the man-made label of anthropologist, scientist, or biologist, and they feel that they deserve a special little podium for them to speak and address you when it comes to this topic, I basically laugh my ass off. You're probably going to, it'd probably make just as much sense to speak to a gynecologist as a biologist when it comes to this topic, right? They aren't taught about this in university. They don't know shit. Prove me wrong. Do you see what I'm getting at? I recently saw a clip of what a guy even calls himself a celebrity biologist. And he's on a celebrity animal biologist. And he's on Joe Rogan. And together they're laughing at the topic of Sasquatch. So for all of you, and I know there is potentially, I'd say hundreds of thousands of you out there right now, you know exactly where the comedy comes from when I'm mentioning this, <laughs> right? First of all, you got some fuck stick on TV proclaiming to be a celebrity. Strike number one, that should almost count as strike number two, just being on TV. Well, I guess it wasn't TV, it was a podcast. Well, let's give him one strike then, just for self-proclaiming he's a celebrity, all right? And then he publicly says and laughs that this topic is hogwash, not true, not a chance. That guy just ultimately discredited himself across the board. It's like, you know what, go stick with gerbils. Okay, buddy, go stick with gerbils or hamsters. All right, that was, that's, that's what you learned about, that's where you're qualified to talk about. Go hang a monkey off your lap and give him a banana or something. All right, and stay away from this topic. Who is a true expert when it comes to this topic? I don't think anybody's an expert. I do know one thing, the First Nations people were absolutely originally knowledgeable about them when the non-First, North American First Nations people came here and didn't know anything about it. And they were told, honestly, looked in the eye and told the flat out facts about this topic. Whereas, they were also probably told about grizzly bears and black bears and wolves and wolverine. And uh, what else have they been told about? Moose and mountain goats? Where the non, non-original North Americans are probably soaking it all in. Uh-huh, yeah, okay, cool, right on. And then of course we have the Sabe, the eight to 10, 12 foot tall, um, inter interdimensional spiritual beings that are here as well. And then the non-original North Americans probably went, ho, 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 wait a minute. You know, actually, we, we know that we've never ever been here ever before. It's a brand new world to us, but we're going to tell you that that's actually hearsay and folklore and a story. Okay, let's not talk about that one again. You realize how embarrassing that is now? And that's why I have chosen myself to refer to these beings as the Sabe people, the Ojibwa name for them, because I'm hopefully what I'm trying to do for myself is I'm going back to where everybody else screwed up and I'm listening to the people that know. I'm listening to the people that have had generations, hundreds of generations of people running around on this land, and they knew before the non-first North Americans came here, they knew, they knew the truth, they knew the facts, and they shared them, got kicked into the dirt. So what I'm doing is I'm blowing the dust off of that knowledge from those people, and I'm trying to promote it, and listen to it, and make it mandatory, instead of listening to some douchebag, anthropologist, our biologist, or scientist who got a degree not in the real world but in that classroom and somehow has managed to get their faces in front of the camera numerous times and on almost every single TV show when it comes to this topic. How stupid is that? <laughs> right? It just doesn't make any sense. It's funny um, and I do like to shit on these people. I do. I get a kick out of it. It's too easy. But somebody has to do it. If, if somebody doesn't do it it's not going to stop going around in circles. These people have kept this topic and all you going in a complete circle, chasing your tail easily for years because nobody stopped them, right? They need to be stopped. Kick the side, turn the camera away from them, and put the camera on the people. Put the camera on the First Nations people. You put the camera on the people who have seen these things firsthand. That's the only people you need to talk about when it comes to this topic. That's it. They're the only ones. For obvious reasons. What factor would it be that would convince you to listen to somebody else when it comes to this topic for the answers other than the people who have seen these things numerous times at times or the people whose generations have been here for hundreds of generations and known about the whole time? Who are you gonna listen to? For real? Are you gonna listen to some douche that come out of a university when it comes to this topic? I don't think so. Not me. Not a chance. Right? 
But it's kind of funny, uh, yeah, I'm going on a bit of a rant, but I'm finally outside. It's easy. I like standing in the woods finally. It's in the evening. I got enough bug dope on me to probably cause cancer in half an hour, but whatever. I got no mosquito bites. But uh, it's kind of funny. A while back, a couple months back, I caught one of the comments on my phone again by accident. And there's some guy on there just slinging his dick. Um, what did he say? His claim to fame was, um, and I'll never ever say a name of somebody in the Bigfoot community on this channel ever. I will not promote anyone. All right. So all these times you guys ask me, hey, what do you think of so-and-so? What do you think of so-and-so? What do you think of so-and-so? I don't. <laughs> Their names won't be spoken here but from me. But this guy, his claim to fame, he went, he went something like, uh, I challenged so-and-so, so-and-so, the Canadian guy. I challenged him at every single thing he ever said or presented online, and I exposed him as a fraud and a liar every time, and I'm a wildlife biologist, and you, and he starts coming on to me. <laughs> I'm like, you're a wildlife biologist. I go, well, uh, obviously you suck at it, so maybe you should maybe go to drywall or something and get a job in a drywall crew packing drywall sheets and do something you might be good at. And of course, this guy took the bait and absolutely pulled a full Karen snap sandwich. And then I just kept on sticking it to him and sticking it to him until he finally realized he was making ass out of himself and he disappeared and never came back. I don't even know why I shared that with you guys, but this is kind of funny. I guess an example of me wanting to take these egomaniacs who want that attention and they want that title and making sure they know that they don't have a title here when it comes to this topic and they never will. They should shut their asses up, sit down in the back of the room, and watch and listen to the people who have seen these things, and listen to every single detail, and soak it in, and learn honestly. Quit trying to control people, control what they see, control people to what they learn, allowed to say, allowed to not say, allowed to read out loud. Just shut the F up and sit in the back of the room, sit on your hands, and shut up, and you watch the First Nations people, you listen to them, like you should have from the beginning and you listen to the numerous thousands of people who have seen these things firsthand. That's the only people you have that can represent this topic as thoroughly as we can at this point. Prove me I'm wrong. <laughs> right? Prove me I'm wrong. Are you kidding me? You give me some Western civilization person, academic type with a title from inside a classroom at a university, and I'm supposed to give that douche respect when it comes to this topic? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Not a chance in hell. It's not going to happen. So, now I got that little spiel out. Hopefully I made sense. I know sometimes I don't when I go on my little goofy talks. But let's get back to sharing from the people who know. Right? From the people who know. Now, what do we got? got a mosquito over the top of my hat. Oh, I hate that. A little story. Somewhere around the wonderful age of 10 or 11, my friend Kevin and I were exploring a creek that ran through our farm. Then under a stone railroad bridge, built in 1869, and taking a 90 degree turn before going under another bridge on the road we lived. It was a low swampy area which lay on the north side of the turn full of Osage orange trees. Osage? Osag? O-S-A-G-E, orange trees. I'm not familiar with that word, sorry you guys. One hot afternoon we came across this huge snapping turtle caught in an old wire fence not far from the road. My friend poked him with a stick, which he immediately bit into. This fellow was not happy. After a bit, we saw my dad coming home from the work and flagged him down. He stopped and assessed the situation and managed to pull the fence away so the prehistoric creature, looking creature, could escape. This snapper was the size of a wheelbarrow, turned upside down the kind you haul concrete in. I'd seen many snappers over the years in the creek, but nothing like this monster. This year was 1968 or maybe 1969, along Chappelle Creek in northern Ohio. We then jumped to the back of the truck and rode home with another adventure collected and stored. <laughs> well, it's funny how many people are chiming in on that massive um, turtle sighting email that came in a while back, isn't it? I welcome them. Keep them coming in. I'm curious about it. I don't have snapper, snapper turtles here where we live, but I've definitely seen some in West Virginia. I've seen them down in the south for sure. I understand people eat them, they're supposed to be really good too, right? But uh, it would be cool if somebody eventually possibly gets a picture of that five foot thing that the guy saw on the road, right? But thanks for sending that in, alright? Appreciate it. So it's titled Scream from a Texas rancher. 
Hi Steve, I want to share another story before work. It takes me to the wild parts of Montana and I won't have cell phone or internet service to tell it then. This may or may not be related to Sasquatch. I've never been certain as to what exactly made a terrible scream. There's a particular lake in Texas that allows hunters to hunt on the Army Corps' land around it. No rifles are allowed. As far as I know, the hunting permits are still free. One year, I tried to get a hunting lease for white-tailed deer without success, so I decided to opt for the free bow hunting around the lake. My brother wanted to hunt with me, so we went together and got our free permits at the Army Corps office. It was exciting to see if we had what it took to hunt deer on public land. Being self-employed provided the freedom to scout the public land on weekends, a good tour of two months prior to the beginning of the hunting season. It was a tract of public lands the most difficult to reach by pickup and furthest away from any highway or main road. I purposely chose to hunt that area mainly because it's hard to get to. We knew well enough to never hunt on a weekend since others would be out there making noise or probably smoking cigarettes. My choices on where and when to hunt later proved to be fruitful. Every time we hunted there, I carried in and out most of the gear on my back, even in temperatures approaching 100 degrees. One week I decided to wait until a Wednesday afternoon to sneak in alone and put up a portable tree stand along a well-used trail. Most of the deer hadn't been observed until early or late afternoon anyway. Just prior to reaching the tree, I had chosen ahead of time to place my tree stand in. A large rattlesnake was seen stretched out in the shade against a very old concrete water trough for cattle. You see, that land used to be a part of the historical cattle ranch that existed prior to the creation of the nearby public lake. In a few hours, I'd be coming down out of that tree from my tree stand and thought of stepping on a rattlesnake in the dark wasn't a good one. Only having a compound bow, I grabbed as many large stones as I could, guess could be found and quickly smashed that rattlesnake. My life and health are more important to me than getting a deer. Any animal within a quarter mile could hear the sounds of the stones being used to kill the rattlesnake. I accepted that and proceeded to set up my deer stand anyway. A few hours went by and as expected, after making all that noise, no deer showed up while I was there in the tree stand. The sun was quickly setting and after being unnerved by the rattlesnake, I got down out of the tree a little early and soon had my gear strapped onto my back and began heading out on the trail and then to a fire break. There was still a little light left and wanted to make a call on my cell phone to let family know I was okay and was headed back to my pickup. While walking on that fire break and talking on the phone, all of a sudden there was a powerful scream that erupted to my left. Despite my focus being on the phone conversation, that scream shook me to the core. My spine tingled and the hair on the back of my neck felt like it, felt like it was electrically charged. I quickly asked a family member if they heard that awful scream. Surprisingly, they weren't able to hear it. My eyes strained to see what could possibly have been such a horrible sound aimed right at me. It was obvious where I came from, but the now dark tree canopies obscured whatever was watching me closely as I walked. It was under one of the many live oak trees approximately 100 yards away on a neighboring ranch. My guess is that it had been watching or listening for me soon after I had made my presence known in the woods by smashing that snake a few hours earlier. I put as much distance be behind from that area as possible at a fast paced walk. Being alone at night, unarmed as far as a gun, and having a bunch of gear strapped to my back was not a good combination. I kept looking back behind me while walking away but saw and heard nothing. You could sense that whatever screened was still monitoring my whereabouts. I still had a long ways to walk in the now pitch black darkness with no moon to help at all. Thankfully my walk back was uneventful. You can probably imagine what it was like to finally reach the pickup, get my gear unloaded into it, and get the heck out of Dodge. Just reaching the main road from there takes a while. I grew up in the woods and am familiar with big cat screams, foxes, frogs and such. I've heard all kinds of animal distress sounds and none of them matched the high-pitched scream directed at me that evening. All I can say is it definitely got my attention. Thanks for what you do, Steve Michael. Michael, thanks for that email, man. And I can relate to that uh, hike out to the truck with your bow and all your shit. That's exactly what happened to me. But I wasn't screamed at. The thing was just like right there, sitting there on the rock staring at me. It was, it was past last seeing light, so. The walk, the walk of terror, right? The walk of terror and as well the walk into the club and no return. Being a full-time member, nothing you can do about it. Thanks for that share, man. And send, send back any good, useful knowledge if you come across it that you might think the people might might be uh, better off hearing, okay? If you ever do, make sure you email it into us, all right? And I'll share it with everybody. Be safe out there, man. It said red. That's funny how sometimes it'll actually grab when it says red and I'll start to read it. 
All right, here we go. This looks like it's a long one. I hope it's a goodie. Marked it as red, and here we go. Greetings once again, Steve. Writing you again, and thank you very much for getting my previous message out. Makes me wonder about how events, or rather, our own impulses to do something at a certain time flows with that of others. Isn't that true? I resonated a lot with Owlman's latest response to you, and I'm glad he broached the topic of others besides Sabe. That's actually another aspect of my field of experiential knowledge and study that I might delve into as I go. This message is not going only going to be lengthy, but it will entail things that will make you and others feel some unpleasant sensations in the pit of your stomach. Well, I guess that's what we're after. Or I guess maybe that's what we're ready to face to get to the truth, right? I'm going to tackle the elephant that some have been taking shots at. First of all, I'll address your query regarding my point of how I know that acoustic toning can be used to heal injuries. Right, I remember that. Remember I wanted to know how somebody would know that, as an example, dolphins could heal from sound. A highly mundane and common example is actually cats. Their purring has been documented to have a quality that helps heal bones and that something can readily look up for a citation. Dolphins have also been documented as having a remarkable ability to recover from injury without even scarring as much as others do. That's been researched as a result of marine biologists noting how effectively they can heal from injuries. Another fascinating proof of the power of acoustics can be found if you look up acoustic experiments with water. One of the best ones shows a hose with water running out of it and it actually orients into a spiral as it falls. That also has to do with why people encounter them near waterways. The properties of flowing water open vortex points in their vicinity. So it's not just a matter of hydrating and fishing, but using them as dimensional bylanes or portals as we begin to recognize as of importance. See Victor Schoberger's applied concepts for some ideas on that. David Platus has also noted that disappearances occur in common with bodies of water. Furthermore, it's a big reason why the false powers and parasitic humanoids have a penchant for tainting water. It's part of the memory of and helps hold and maintain higher capacities on this planet when it's clean and flowing smoothly. Thus they make the earth more of a prison world, further open to lower states of resonance. When they do this, thankfully, there are alternate alternative means of purifying water, yet we must do so with ourselves as well. I mentioned that Sabe could use their ability of highly variable acoustic generation as part of a mechanism for creating waves of deep fear in people who they want to drive off or intimidate. And it's something that could be important for us if push comes to shove. The military has already experimented with what, if I remember right, are called acoustic defense systems. And I would even argue that they took that ability in part from entities like the Sabe. Recall how when Dennis Martin went missing, a detachment of Green Beret arrived on the scene but in no way coordinated their activities with those searching for Dennis? Well, it doesn't it, well, doesn't it stand to reason that they were not looking for Dennis at all, but rather what took him? Despite what I'm about to get into, it should be evident that while there are some savvy that are outliers and dangerous outcasts, and while I strongly suspect they're in the minority, we don't know for certain yet how many are like that or if they are possibly organized in their own clans or enclaves. Maybe that explains why there are so many people getting taken in around and around Yosemite. Otherwise, though, it seems that an excessive degree of animosity towards others is not condoned by the society at large. They're overall civil people with their own moral code, and I think what needs and will inevitably happen is that those of us who care to maintain our innate holistic human aspect may well be facing, be faced with a choice if what we see happening with our own collective continues much further on the path that it is headed down. We're already dealing with a split between our humanity and seeing as it did come about in part because of parasitic humanoids. It would be nice if it, would, if it could be mended. However, if I don't have to mingle with those who have taken their brain gremlin juice injections and never have to hear the phrases, you need a mask, or see another child be forced to wear one, I don't exactly feel like I'd be missing out. Where do they come from is one of the big questions. I think we'll find out something more certain when we get more direct answers from the Sabe. Well, I'm not sure of the specifics, I can make an educated, intuitive guess as to what they would tell us. What I come to recognize is that life arises innately 
in forms that if not anthropomorphic so much in a physical aspect have this inherent awareness and sense of self. This is because creation was formed from the mind of such a being. Knowledge of this is revered in every culture and in the deepest levels of philosophical truth. Sabe could be so old or rather so little interfered with in some cases they have awareness of that from a timeless perspective maybe even memories of their creation. And I'll bet we did at one point too, without a doubt. When I state that life was generated from the mind of a higher being, I meant it in a highly literal, but not necessarily non-scientific fashion. The etheric forces such as plasma, electrical current, acoustics, and water all act as a conduit for which reflections of this higher consciousness that is and permeates all things assumes higher density form as it descends or modulates through phase changes and conduction. What this means is that you can have spontaneous generation of life via this medium so long as the conditions are right. Or life forms can also phase into and out of the state of manifesting with the right kind of mechanisms. Creationism doesn't do itself any favors by trying to discredit evolution. Yet on the other hand, the conventional and enforced model of science discounts it in part because there are those who are desperate to keep us from understanding that we can that we can comprehend and utilize concepts that we are conditioned to regard as ludicrous or incomprehensible. Here, here. This isn't just where we ultimately came from and returned to, but also a shared aspect of reality that we can navigate, which is another reason why I keep coming back to the metaphor of existence as an ocean, as I elaborated upon previously. It's even worth considering that perhaps this explains reports of cryptids and encounters of beings even more fantastical than the Sabbath. Maybe there are instances where things that have no coherent precedent for their physical existences pop up as a kind of spontaneously generated life form. The Tibetan people even have a concept of how thought form entities known as Tulpa can be created, and that has some major implications in that regard as well. Again, we do have traditions of long term contact with and awareness of this realm. I would highly recommend Graham Hancock's book, Supernatural. You can find his representation on the topic entitled Elves, Aliens, Angels, and Ayahuasca online. In the book, he gives a rather disquieting answer as to what this class of beings and others want to do with us. And to be fair, it's more than that, and yet. It's more than that, and yet. Sometimes, it's in ways that go against our boundaries and moral ideals. Recently, another channel rated an account from a railroad crew where one of their team went missing for a few days. When they found him, he told them he'd been held captive in a pit by a female sabe and that she'd been forcing herself upon him. He died of exhaustion and shocks. He died of exhaustion and shock soon after. All right, now how the hell did he get the thing to work for her? <laughs> right, she must have been kind of hot. Got a lot of wax drips, right? Just kidding, sorry. Another account explains of a formation of boulders off of a coastline as having ended up there when a man from a local tribe decided he'd try being husband to a savvy woman. It didn't work out, and he, as he left in his canoe, she hurled the rocks in his direction from the shore. One case in particular that Polides asked for the full report on and got a call back from someone who took an indignant tone, like he expected David to be able to guess what happened to the person in question. Hammerson Peters shares some in-depth accounts in his channel and had one case recently that was on account from a woman who related having been taken and held by a younger Sabe and his parents who tried to keep her as his wife but eventually agreed to bring her back to her community. On the other hand, there is the famous case from the remote region of Russia that having contact with beings they called the Almas and captured a female who ended up being bred by some of the men in the village. The offspring that survived were known to be prodigiously strong and the exhumed skull of the one showed something like Neanderthal traits. So what do they want from us, Steve? Everything. We don't think of ourselves as much in the inhuman aspects of our society trample our confidence in what we are and our potential. Of course, the conclusion that other beings can have that deep and intimate of an interest in us is horrifying in its own way. Maybe that explains some of the aspects of extreme moralism and denial of our own aspects in that regard. It's easier for an outside intelligence to see what we are and try to deny about ourselves in part because of how it can make us so vulnerable. They seem superior to us, and no doubt are in some ways we're fascinating to them because they 
the interplay between our similarities and differences is captivating for them. Deliberate or not, they have an awareness and compulsion to interact with us out of a deep, possibly unconscious, instinctive recognition that they are learning about themselves through us. One gets the impression that the Sabe get conflicted in their feelings around us as well, and that might explain the contradictory and, at times, menacing behavior in some cases. They know that we can be extraordinarily dangerous and alter or render our shared surroundings toxic in ways that must astound them. Yet our innate qualities and the state of our relatable juxtaposition in our own evolution and conception of ourselves that we're in enthralls them. There is the old line about the sons of God beholding the daughters of men and realizing that they were fair and desiring wives from among them. Maybe that explains the stone throwing and pacing people not just to ward them away from their territory in some cases, but also out of a thrill, a fascination of how we react. No doubt. No doubt. It sounds like a common game. There's something about it that they like, for sure. We have a connection with our instincts, but it's tempered by the context that we have ingrained in us by our own societal conditioning and concerns that they are not as bound by. So they like to see how each person will go, rational and seeking understanding, running with their own base response? What makes someone switch between or fluctuate in those modes? Another point possibly relevant to all this, the incidences where people are snatched away and their remains are found with their clothing folded nearby. What if some cases are inexperienced juvenile sabbat who just want to run off with the person for a while even though they may not have any concrete ill intent to do lasting harm but end up killing them because they move too fast or through dimensions with them? According to the First Nations people who lived here for longer than us, their relationship with the Sabe was just as mercurial as, and yet there also claims that they had established treaties between each other. Then white colonizers came out of left field. I'm not trying to make excuses or arguments for moral relative, relativism, but if you make a major mistake or do something that shows you and your people are prone to be treacherous, is there perhaps an interpretation of the golden rule that says if you do so, other beings then have a justification to treat you in a manner that tells you you've messed up, or in a way that reflects your own worst aspects back at you. Truly advanced beings wouldn't go too far into that, but as you keep emphasizing, we're dealing with other human beings, and the lower complexes and inclinations are often vented by us parties that we feel are deserving of retrib retribution in some form. The balance between that and how to defend ourselves against those that do not have our best collective interest at heart is something we're getting acquainted with. Then again, on the highest levels, maybe so much that is untoward and horrifying is allowed to happen on the physical level because it is seen that all experiences, because it is seen that all experiences ultimately drive consciousness to become more perceptive and refined. Life yearns for experience and sensation above all else, and of course, it gains this from interacting with other aspects of itself, yet because of the nature of how conscious forms manifest into, into individuals, each wavelength form as biological being has its own distinct wavelength pattern. That's why reality and our interactions with others can be so dynamic, but also occur on a basis that we can understand. So long as we can find the space to empathically recognize our own innate aspects, even in the aspects of our own shadow. I'm sure there are beings that include some members of the Sabe that are miffed by our proclaimed moral standards. Now they don't have merit, not that, not that they don't have merit need to be better codified, but from a class of beings who are more free and unfettered by shame, we probably look remarkably hypocritical between what we will denounce and then take part in when we think no one else is watching. No shit. Part of the problem is Part of the problem for us is that while boundaries are a value to our holistic development, we don't actually practice them consistently enough as a collective, and acts that are abuse, abusive go under the radar as normalized. No mistaking it, there are those that insidiously and shrewdly studied how to manipulate our nature for eons over time, and one of our biggest weaknesses is that we can be driven into acceptance of and adopting detrimental ways of reacting and and ways of life that ultimately perpetuate dysfunction. Perhaps that is one major way in which the Sabbath can really help us. They are evidently living outside of and in a state of rejection of being herded and treated as cattle. 
My conclusion on what needs to happen, and thankfully what I see occurring, is that we are inevitably going to be faced with the opportunity to openly interact with these beings, and that a key aspect of this will be how we effectively understand one another. Not just with them, but with everyone and everything we share the world with. Those who act on a paradigm of domination and fear based on an unwillingness to compromise and find common terms of respectful interaction are being exposed and rejected by more than one aspect of collective intelligence. Maybe even innate mechanisms that guide the refinement of conscious interaction between others and arguably we need the consciousness and wise ones to become our allies. It's going to be one heck of a ride ahead, Steve. I appreciate your, your stated intent to be left alone. I would like to see that work out in a way that gives you what will really allow you to find a resolution for this on your own terms. That being stated, you've already got their attention, so maybe you'd be better off not so much by declaring an intent to be left alone. If you do, the ones that would honor that would actually be those most likely to be of assistance to you, whereas those who have no inclination to honor your pro proclamation wouldn't be at all inclined to be swayed by it. Keep in mind, though, there are means of appealing to yourself as representative of higher powers that will bear some form of retribution for those that would harm you. I think it's ultimately why the name of Christ in prayer has the effect of dispelling negative intentions from some of these beings in some cases. It represents a collective positive archetypal, archetypal force that stands for high deals of human grace, power, and sovereignty. First Nations people and other cultures who have their own modalities for accessing that as well. Part of the reason why I urge people to look into European folklore and traditions in my previous message because we would because we would do well to reacquaint ourselves with our own shamanic heritage and that's our own unique and individual power and knowledge that we can stand in, in that for ourselves rather than feeling we don't have it and are beholden or dependent on others to show us the way. All right, now you just spent. Now you just gave me a sentence in Norwegian. Who are you talking to, mad me? I can barely read the English language. Hur meg al soner, a hemdal stop up osvena. Gjev krav til rota. Tried to sound like my grandmother. My blood comes from Norway. A phrase in Old Norse meaning, "Hear me, all sons of Hemdal, stand up from your sleep, give strength to the roots." All the best in finding what will serve you best on your own path of becoming. Thank you once again for using your voice to share that of others and acting as a solid advocate, Steve. I'll look forward to hearing it again, and maybe it be heard through eternity. Well, there you go. Karen, thank you so much for that detailed share. You have been looking into this for quite some time, and you seem to be quite, quite very knowledgeable. I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody here listening. We absolutely appreciate you sharing. And um, please feel free to share more in the future, all right? There's eyes and ears are here and they're open and they want, they just got a thirst for it all. So just keep it coming. It's funny, you know, uh, I don't talk too much about myself and these beings as much as I do about everybody else. I, I'm more, I, I want to hear from everybody, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, not a lot of people, you always get a handful of people that seem to try to tell me what I should be doing or how come you don't do this, why don't you do that, you should be asking this and you should be asking that. Don't tell me what I should be doing. I'm here to give all of you an option to do what you think others should do yourself, right? Everybody do what they think people should do, do it yourself. Lead the way. Show us what you got. Lead. And show us. Don't tell anybody what they should or shouldn't do. Oh, I'm not talking to the previous email either. I'm just going on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> But uh, getting back to what I was meaning about me and what I do and what I've been thinking about, obviously, I do. I think I feel I've had a couple options now where I could probably just sat down on a log in the timber and said, "Okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. Come on over." And I'm not ready. I haven't been ready in the past. Um, I know. I have a feeling I will eventually probably just do it. I'll probably just sit down. I got a few places. I mean, I'm, you can tell. I don't need to uh, talk too much about the places I go, the places I've been, what I normally do. You can see that in all of my hundreds of video clips, right? There's no shorter opportunities for me to, to run these beings, and I'm basically I'm sharing the same forest with them 9 out of 10 times during my daily, weekly, and monthly, and yearly adventures, right? So, when the time, what I'm saying is when the time's right, 
I will sit down and I'll say, all right, come on, let's do this and see if it's a possibility it'll go down. Because I do know last fall when I had the new hunter with me and we found all the broken sticks. I also, before that, I had a, two or three other people from the immediate area who lived there, shared experiences with me. I heard that grouse, drumming grouse, every single time I got out of the tent all night long through the dark. Six trees pushed over my tent when I had another soul of you before. And each time I say out loud, just leave me alone. Don't scare the shit out of me, just leave me alone. I'm just here to grab my elk and go home. And, uh, and I have been successful getting my game every year. But it's interesting to see what happened was last fall when I left my partner standing there and I went and I hiked back to go get the quad, which is about a mile, maybe a mile and a bit. And he said he could hear the, that tree getting blasted right where I was. And he said he could not believe that I didn't hear it and that it was so loud it was absolutely ridiculous. And I didn't hear a thing. I didn't hear a thing. How do you explain that one? Dude, I'm, automatically my thought went straight to, uh, well, I did say out loud numerous times, just leave me alone, just please leave me alone. And I wonder if they can possibly manipulate that. And looking at that as a possibility because I experienced it. I trust my friend with my life, I know what he heard, I didn't hear it, but I previously had said, just leave me alone. So many different amazing possibilities, right? There's so many things out there we don't know, we should know, and it's been with being withheld from us, it's not fair, and we are making big progress, right? Wouldn't you say? I think we're making great progress. I think it's uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is, like I said earlier, I've been trying to um, offer up everybody different ways of looking and talking and seeing things and offer up different angles than following around the same old people who have really hogged that video camera lens and the narrative and made it about them, right? So, so take note of that. When you come across people, individuals online in front of the camera, no matter what the topic is, as soon as you can see that they are making it about them, run. <laughs> if you want to advance yourself honestly in that topic, run. That's my advice to everybody. Obviously, don't do what I say. Do what you do. Go with your gut instinct. But from what I've learned so far on this ride is you see somebody who wants it to any topic to be about them, you run. If it's the true knowledge, if you want to get better at, at whatever you're trying to get better at, if this knowledge you're after, run from those individuals. They got nothing for you, sadly. Whew. How's that for some babbling? Time to get these fatties in. There's a video up. Go get this frickin' farm paid for tomorrow. And get back on track soon.